Did you ever had a defining moment in your life? For me, that moment was in the early 90s. I helped my father on the field with harvesting of our potatoes. And he let me drive the potato harvester for the first time. At that moment, I knew I wanted to be a potato farmer. I'm Jacob van der Borne. I'm a third generation farmer on a family owned farm close to the Belgium border. And we grow potatoes at our farm. I'm known to be a front runner in precision farming. And I'm here today because I hope that many generations of farming will follow. But I also know that that only will happen if we start working together. Farming the future together. My grandfather started our farm 70 years ago. He was growing wheat and barley for seed production. He took, so he took fields from the forest and fertilized them with manure from the neighbors. He prepared his farm for the next generation. My father took over half of that farm in the late 70s. He saw an opportunity to grow potatoes for a local French fry company. He growed with that company, so he needed more land. So he rented land from the neighbors and exchanged his own land with the neighbors to grow. Our region is known to, be very, to, to have very small fields, not square, so, a lot of, uh, so not rectangular, and that's hard to manage. My career started very early in my life. I was always playing with the potatoes. I did my lower and mid agriculture school, and I was ready to take over the farm. But my father told me, convinced me to go for a higher education. I was not convinced that I needed that, but I listened and I went to the Haas in Den Bosch. Some teachers there convinced me that if I would join, they would learn me new things about farming. So I went to the Haas in Den Bosch, and I did a lot of internships. One of these internships was at my local French fry company. And on that training, I learned that our quality and our yield was at the low end of all their farmers. I was shocked about that. And I was determined to change that. Another internship that I did was at a company called Grimmy. They made potato harvester, and my, uh, my task there was to test a system for mapping yields. This system could actually map our yields and our quality and could be the solution for my challenge. So after my bachelor degree, I was ready to get my hands dirty. I took over the farm from my father and worked together with my brother. And the first thing we did was start precision farming by buying GPS equipment. This GPS equipment was actually changing a lot for us because it killed the overlap. So with the small fields and a lot of corners, we had a lot of overlap. And we reduced that overlap from 12% to just one. All the initial investments were paid back in just three months. After that success, I implemented the yield monitoring systems on my potato harvester, and I found out that we had a big yield gap. On one spot of the field, we only harvested 30 tons. On another, more than 80 tons. So why? Why is there such a big yield gap? I went to universities to check if they could explain what the differences were. 
And I came to the conclusion that we did not only have a, a big yield gap, but also a big knowledge gap. So, that knowledge gap came because we were doing the things that we did for three generations. We are not answering the right questions. So precision farming. If I talk about precision farming, the first thing that people think about is robots, sensors, drones. But actually, all those technologies are just tools. Precision farming. What is the definition of precision farming? For me, that definition is on the right time, on the right location, doing the right thing. So when this is the definition of precision farming, how old do you think precision farming is? Would that be 20 years, 40 years, 60 years? Or maybe my grandfather had this book. This was his agenda. My grandfather wrote it down, everything he did, every single day after his work. Who of you is still doing that? Please, hands. I got four hands in the, in the room. Do you think that my grandfather was forced to do that? Why do you think he did that then? He did that to learn from his own mistakes. But you guys, nobody is writing anything down. So, you already know everything there is to know? That is the big problem. So, in the past, the Incas were better farmers than we are now. The Egyptians built buildings better than we can do now. We forgot to learn, and we lost a lot of our knowledge. So, if we talk about precision farming, what is the most important data to start precision farming? The most important data to start precision farming is yield data, because with yield data we can calculate our yield potential. But yield potential in farming is three things. It's soil yield potential, it's seed yield potential, and it's weather yield potential. I started with the soil yield potential. I bought every sensor available in the world to map my fields. And we found out that the, fi the, dif the fields had different, uh, different soil zones. And those soil zones had different potentials. So we compared those four different zones with a battery. By comparing the zones with a battery, we could understand how to charge every part of the soil to its fullest potential. The small battery we charged multiple times, and the big battery we charged twice or three times. After a while, we also figured out that we could enlarge the small battery, by adding extra organic matter. The second yield potential is the seed yield potential. How does my potato plant need to look like for a high yield? I bought every sensor in the world available to measure biomass, chlorophyll, nitrate, and we saw a lot of data, but that couldn't answer the question how does my potato plant need to look like for a high yield? So I went to the Wageningen University and I asked them, how do I know this? How do I know what is good for my plants? And they said, after the war, they developed growing models for the main crops. And those growing models shows we now use that growing model for actually knowing how and when a potato plant needs to look like. This model was never updated. 
but also never digitalized. So we had a lot of sensors, a lot of data, but still no model. So I asked them, how did you do it? And they had a probing program. They went every single week to the fields, mapping the, mapping the crop, mapping the yield, and comparing to find out what the good was. And that's exactly what we started doing. We, ma we made our own growing model and integrated all those sensor data to have a model that we could work with. There was only one problem. If you collect a lot of data, that data needs to be processed. And to process the data, I needed it a very good internet connection. But I am on the end of the world against the Belgian border, seven kilometers from the nearby village. There was no internet. <laughs> I asked all the companies if they please would give, deliver me a fast internet connection. Not possible. So I started my own glass fiber company. <laughs> we made a glass fiber network for four villages, for all the farmers, and we now have a gigabit internet for all the farmers. Things were looking good. A ah, gigabyte internet speed, a growing model that works, increased yields, everything looked fine. But then, 2016, we had severe weather. Half of our crops were flooded. So we had the best soil yield potential, we had the best seed yield potential. But without good weather yield potential, nothing is growing. So when we, when we faced that, we found out that we need to make the system more resilient. So we learned that we needed to take care of the watering when it's dry and dewatering when it's wet. We also learned that our soils and the crops on there need to be more mixed. So we introduced mixed cropping and winter cropping. Another problem that we had was the shortage of workers. And soon again, soon again I saw that an opportunity in autonomous vehicles. Robots that were driving our fields with the easy tasks. Those robots could, comp could uh, work instead of my workers, and I would have more time. Another thing that we also integrated was flying with drones. We used drones for spraying, for fertilizing, for mapping our fields. But there was one problem. Our government did not allow us to use those drones. They could only be used in restricted areas. So I asked our government, yeah, what do I do? And they said, yeah, close your shed, and then you can fly indoors. I said, yeah, nothing is growing indoors. That didn't make sense. So I googled a controlled area. And I figured out that every airport has a CTR, a controlled traffic region. So I applied to have an airport. <laughs> and two years after that, I'm now owning the first drone airport <laughs> in the Netherlands. In 2020, 21, 23, and 24, we had severe weather again. But that was not the biggest problem anymore. My biggest problem is what people think about farmers. Our children think that milk comes from the shop. If we want to continue farming, if the next generation is, is willing to continue the farming, we need to tell the real farming story. We need, to, we need to say that farmers are not only producing food, but also making the environment more resistant against the weather. Precision farming will be the solution, but it will never 
never be the only answer. The real farmers do the work. So, will my children still be farmers? I'm convinced they will. And to help them, we're going to start a new academy.